for the video series, Five Things You Wanted to Know. Courtney and I are here in my studio, and today we're going to talk about coral. And the first thing I want to talk about coral is why coral is a great starter for a collection. There's a lot of depth to coral, but it's also very good for very beginners who want to collect vintage jewelry. And I want to show you this book. Um, this is Costume Jewelry 101 by uh, Julia Carroll, who I've talked to. She's a lovely lady. But in this version of the 101, she talks about four different um, manufacturers that are good starters, and coral is included in that. And one of the reasons is, is because Coral was one of the largest jewelry companies in Rhode Island. Um, they started off early in the 1900s in New York, but they moved to Rhode Island um, when things got really large. Um, they had the largest jewelry factory, not in Rhode Island, but in the world. And in 1950, the plant was 175,000 square feet, which is kind of like almost a block long square. And it employed 3,500 people. Sales in 1946 were 32 million. So that just gives you some perspective about the size of this company. It was clearly one of the very largest. Now, I think an interesting story is about the plant. The plant became the de facto standard for people who came to study. It was like jewelry university. And think of this in the late 20s, early 30s, um, depression era. People came and worked there for 50 cents an hour, but they got a complete education on all the aspects of jewelry manufacturing. So this was a big deal. People came from all over the world, literally, and they opened their doors to people from Germany, France, Romania, just and, and all over the Americas to, to come and study here and work. So I think that's an interesting story and something they've given back. This building actually still exists in, in Rhode Island, and, and you can see a picture of it there. Um, I, I have to say, this was started by Emanuel Cohn and Carl Rosenberger, and Coro is the first two letters of their last names. So Cohn and Rosenberger became Coro, and that was incorporated in uh, about 1943. In 1969, they started a series of acquisitions. So the name Coral and the operations actually moved around a lot. When Coral was in its heyday producing massive volumes, they had manufacturing facilities in more than just Rhode Island. They had it in other um, international countries. So, you know, again, quite large, but it did change hands a lot between the late 60s and eventually became consolidated in Canada and closed in about the 1990s. First thing is we're going to talk about uh, the signatures and we're going to talk about some advertising after that. But to start off with, I want you to understand that Coro had several different divisions within its company and they had Vendome which was the higher end, Coral Craft, which was a higher end. They had duets. They had a lot of different names. We are only focusing on Coral because in and of itself, it's huge and there's many, many different kinds. So we're only looking at the Coral signatures. And what you can see is, um, again, I, I have created a chart that shows you all the ones you're gonna run into and it'll be in the back of this presentation. But for now, we can see we've got the um, tag card, which is coral and has a pegasus on it. And then we see another set down here that has a hanging tag that says coral. And it was interesting in that it was advertised in life. So one side says coral and the other one says life. Um, this pin looks like a pin cushion. But if you turn it over, it was one of the ones where it was a pretty clear signature right there in coral. And um, it has the C, 
which we've talked about in almost every one of the videos. That's the copyright signature, and that would be post-1958. Um, so you can see some examples. But if you look at this chart, you'll see all the options that there are. There's coral that's just not in script, and that was as early as 1919, although you're not going to find very much of that. I had like one or two pins out of a collection. The coral script without the C, which was about 1930s, 40s, and then coral with the copyright, we talked about that one, and coral pegasus, which is this little uh, emblem as well, and that started in 1938. Now, if you find something that has coral pegasus, does that mean, oh, I know that this is 1938? Well, the answer is no, it just started being used in 1938, and it stayed that way for a long time. Another example of that is on this box of coral, which we've talked about before, the original boxes that these things came in, and that is another example of Pegasus, probably most likely 50s, 1960s. All right, um, coral, like other, man, uh, you know, other manufacturers we've talked about, did a lot of advertising, and what I have here is examples that are the actual pages taken out of a, a magazine, and I'm not a proponent for doing this, but if you go to any antique shows or any antique shops, you'll always see um, a lot of advertising bins, and I always scan through it because I like to have the ones that are about jewelry that I know, because then you can actually date it exactly. Um, for example, the life set we just looked at. This is exactly the same thing. And this was from 1955. So I know that that life in that particular cotton was around, you know, the mid 50s. And that all, all makes sense. So if you look at these, you can see there's a lot of different examples. And this is the type of advertising that they did. Um, and very often you can find your, your pieces in there. And you can see it was $2 when in 1955 so this was you know they had high end but there was there was a lot of very very reasonable uh reasonably priced jewelry and then in this ad what's interesting is this one which is the lucite moon glow series and and that's done out of plastics and we're going to talk about that later but here you see three good examples of the actual pages from magazines that show the advertisements that help you date exactly what the original price was and uh, what year your set was made in We're going to talk, at, I, uh, number three we're on and we're going to talk about this type of jewelry and I want you to just look at it real closely because what you're seeing in this is it all has this copper colored patina to it if you will um, some more than others but clearly these pieces this one for example is one of the oldest pieces that I have it's that coral non-script signature um, that we talked about earlier. So these pieces all have this this coppery look to them and they're all from about the same time frame which is the 1940s. The thing with this is this is a big piece and, and that's another indicator of age in, in brooches in general is they tended to be much larger um, during this time period. If you look on the back of this you think you know really closely look at the back of that you can't see very much on that, but very, very, very faint in the middle of that body, it's coral. Um, so remember that, that you really need to take, you know, your loop with you when you're looking for jewelry because some of these signatures are pretty well hidden. And sometimes you buy it because you like it and you get home and realize it's a signed piece, which is always a nice thing. So all of these pieces, just to show you, are this copper-colored example of 1940s um, pieces. Now this one is, I love this, it's 
because it's a lot of things. This could be 40s into the 50s. And I say that because of this stone. That's more of the moon glow stone, and that was from the 50s. But then you see the pierced enamel, the bracelet with the book chain, um, and then the matching brooch, which is also has a hook on it, so it can be worn as a necklace as well. Just an example of some of the colors and some of the things that I've collected over the years. Some of the most expensive pieces of coral, I don't own them. And it's because I, if you don't get in front of some of these trends, you know, you can end up, for example, if you're looking at coral jelly bellies, which is clear lucite. Um, you know, they're still going online for a, a couple hundred dollars and you know, I, you just have to pick what you collect in that, in that price range because it can get pretty pricey. Okay, this, this category of coral, I, I love this. It, and here's the good news. It's very inexpensive these days compared to other things. Um, this is all mid-century plastic jewelry, and there's just different variations of it. This is called confetti, and you can see, it looks like candy, is what Courtney said, but it's absolutely true. What are those jelly things that are, you know, have little chunks in them? That's what this looks like, but I, this is out of my own collection, and I've worn this set um, many, many times. It's, uh, here you've got the matching bracelet, very striking blues, corals, gold flecks that are actually in the mold of the plastic. And this was all for, again, mid-century, 1950s, um, matching earrings. I don't wear the earrings as much as I do the other pieces, but it's nice to have all the sets together, and it also always adds value to have a complete set. Here's another example. Um, this is in the aqua blues and if you can see it has tiny little gold flecks again right in the mold um, this is also confetti and that one this one's got you know they have different feels to them though that's the other thing I want you to if you pick up this bracelet it's very very lightweight you look at the back it's 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 kind of plastic through the whole uh, piece this one has some serious weight to it and still has, but this is molded in a, in a, in a gold plated setting. So difference even amongst these pieces. They might have been all in the same category and gone for all about the same money, I'm not sure, but um, there's a different feel to them. And then the last example I wanna show you is this one. And this one is more of a there's more of a sparkle to it, so it's not those chunks that are in it. It's more of a, a the moon glow um, style. And this one has, you know, again, the earrings and the bracelets. See, and this bracelet, even being the same size as that other aqua blue, and this one has much more weight to it. It's done in metal and not plastic. So there's just some examples. And, and I showed you the advertising for this stuff, so... You know, sometimes you can pinpoint exactly where it came from. And it's all marked. The earrings are marked. I see a marking on a pin, but this is the worst marking I've ever seen. Let me show you that. When we talk about misstamped markings, this is the example that I used. If you look at that, you can hardly tell that's what it says. It's, you know, it's a, it's a C in the circle and then coral, but very difficult to see. Bad, bad stamp job. Um, there's a great book that I have in the back of this video you're going to have a couple of things you'll have the the chart that shows you all the different um, signatures and then examples of the signatures and then there's also a resource for both web and for books this one is mid-century plastic jewelry and it's by Susan Klein and Susan I've been to, I met her before. She lives in Chicago. She's really, really knowledgeable. She works in the auction industry and she did a really stellar job on this book in terms of really doing interviews of all the people but uh, that she talks about and really going into depth um, 
and having references. It's a very scholarly um, book that she did. Lots of pictures though, don't get scared. So I'm gonna open this and just show you that there's a whole section here on coral and some signatures we've talked about. She uses that exact same um, advertisement that I showed you with the, the pink moon glow. And then um, just looking through all kinds of examples of coral for mid-century plastics. And she gives some um, general ranges for uh, the prices of them. And I want you to know those are retail prices. Some of them are right on and some of them are, you know, they're different than what you find today because things change over time. You know, things come in and out of favor and, and so the prices of things change. And I just want you to, you know, don't go out there saying, well, you know, I want this set and I'm going to pay this much money for them because, um, you know, a better way to do it, and I hate to say this, but a better way to do it is to really look on eBay just from sheer volume and see what things are going for and that gives you a better understanding than any book will at any given time on what the current prices are um, they're low on eBay Etsy is another good reference um, for pricing it gives you kind of the middle range of things but this is just some really good resources and some good examples of um, mid-century plastic jewelry by coral Okay, we are on number five. And in this one, we're gonna talk about a couple of different things. So I'm gonna say this is miscellaneous things because I've got several different examples of things I wanna show you, all almost in categories by themselves. The first is duets. And you can see this, this article that I have in front of you is all about Coro's duets, which were patented about 1930s the whole um, mechanism of doing duets. And what a duet is, and here's an example of a duet. This one is probably 1930s, all rhinestone. Isn't that pretty though? This one's like, that's exceptional condition on something that old. You don't usually find them like that. But that's why I got it. So if you look at the back of these, you can see this little mechanism that's there. Well, that's, it says, and it says patent pending on it, which is the same patent as the patent that's listed in here for coral. Um, but you take this and you can actually separate these two pieces, and that is what a duet is. So it can be, use that little mechanism, put them together, or take it apart and wear them separately. This would make great dress clips on a summer on a summer dress. I have a girlfriend that wears that all the time and they really look great. So that's what a duet is. It's a, it's a, a single brooch that you can take apart and wear as two separate brooches. And I wanna show you um, some pictures of others. Again, I've had some of these and sold them, basically. Um, I didn't have a collection of this, so those are the things I don't hold on to. Um, example. This one is really well known. It is the coral owls. Again, you can see they're connected, but they can be separated and worn each separately. Um, this comes in all different colors. I think I've had it in green. Uh, I don't know what other color, maybe citrine or a goldish color. And then these are all examples, little bees, little ladybugs, um, a man and woman, and these are all examples of duets. These are one in the category that end up costing a little bit more. Duets are is a category of jewelry that people collect, you know, just like they did Christmas jewelry when I showed you that. And it's like they focus on that. Um, prices for duets are, are higher than any of the others. And just to give you an idea, um, because people always want to know, well, like, how much? Well, you can spend, you know, you can spend easily a couple hundred dollars on a duet where you can get the whole set of mid-century plastic for $50, $75, just to give you a, 
you know, general course, depending on, depending on, you know, how popular they are and, and, and the, man, the materials that went into them. But that's, I want you to know about duets because Coral's famous for them, and um, that's what it's about. This is, um, it's called the Love Locket, and I just love these. I think that they're such a clever thing. It's on this little fleur-de-lis, and it hangs, but what happens is when you open this, it always has a decoration on the front, and when you open it, it's a locket, and there's like room for four different pictures in it. Um, and you can see, there's a mark right there for Coro, but Coro did these, and I actually have one of these on my Ruby Lane website, which is Chapel Hill Vintage Jewels, and it has a picture of the advertisement that goes with these little, and they call them love lockets. Um, they come in twos and fours, but I think they started in about the 1940s and they went to the 1950s. So you'll see, you'll see these, and these are just, I think that they're, they're just precious. The next thing I wanna talk about is book pieces. I'm sure that if you've looked on eBay or any other website, you've seen references to book pieces. And I just wanted to show you a couple of examples of what they call book pieces. Um, for coral and remember this is the book we talked about to start with this is um, Marsha Sparkles Brown who wrote this coral jewelry and I think this one I can't remember exactly what the date was early 2000s so that's the other you know frame of reference you got to remember some of these books are 10 15 years old and, and things definitely change but let me give you a couple of examples of the pieces that I have on this that are book pieces in this so here's an example. Silver plated pearl and aurora borealis blue chaton rhinestone necklace. And here's the earrings and here's the bracelet. And you can see, this is the bracelet, exact match. And here are the earrings. And you see they kind of fold over, which is really pretty. Um, this tells me this whole set is 250 and I can tell $250 is, is the book reference to this and I can tell you it's not anywhere near that much today. So I think there's real good value and real good quality pieces and, and really good, you know, book pieces that you can still find today for coral. Let me give you another example. famous one. This one's called the Coral um, Crystal Question Mark. And now this one's $48, for example, and I would say that's just about right, even in today's, but there's an example of it. So clearly it was done in the clear open back crystals that don't have the foil on them. Very pretty. Gives a great effect with the, the bounce of light off of it. Um, this one comes in the a crystal rhinestone. This one had uh, sapphire, faux sapphire, sapphire rhinestones, and you'll see different variations. But when you see one that looks like that, you kind of immediately know, hey, that looks like a coral. And I think that's it. The other pieces I just have on this are just to show you some different workmanship. This one is the enamel and the whole, you've got the whole set to that. Really lovely with the light blue um, rhinestones and then this one which is coral and marked coral very well with the C you can really see that on the back and a little bit different style of setting but also very lovely rhinestone in greens and blues which is a great combination okay we've talked about a lot of different pieces in the coral line and I bet you that you can go out and you can find pieces in your local flea market or antique shops for as little as $10. I really believe that you can find coral still for that much. And now hopefully I've given you a little background so you can tell what you're looking at. But I also want to show you a little bit about the 
the breadth of the coral line. This um, piece is in my own collection, and this is all glass and a book chain um, necklace and the matching earrings, and this is actually coral. Very, very heavy piece, but this is on the higher end now, very collectible. Part of that is because of bib necklaces are very popular, but it's also quality of manufacturing, and this one is really outstanding. So you have to pay a little bit more for that. Well, thanks very much for joining. That's it for Coral right now. Stick around in, in the video because there's two more things. There's the, the chart for you that shows you all of the different signatures, and then there's some references if you want to, to go online or get a few books and go more in depth on, on Coral. I think the next thing we'll take a look at is Regency. And that will be really fun. So make sure you come back and join us for Regency. And thanks for joining.